This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I'm especially glad that the roads are not icy today. It makes it a lot safer. And we get to be in God's house with each other. Some of our older members, especially if you're brought up in the Lutheran church, you might, you might remember something called pre-Lent. Remember a season called pre-Lent? Some of the churches that use a one-year lectionary, as opposed to our three-year lectionary, had a time called pre-Lent. It was, well, it was this time of year. The idea being that, of course, Holy Week, Jesus' arrest and, and crucifixion, and his, of course his resurrection as well, uh, those were all to be prepared for diligently through the season of Lent. But even Lent being so intense that there would be a season of preparation for the preparation called pre-Lent. And so it is sort of within that same flavor then that during this month of February, because for us Lent will begin uh, in March, we're going to be doing sort of a pre-Lent thing. Uh, each of the Sundays in February, we're going to be hearing from one of the Old Testament minor prophets. Now, you think of the Old Testament prophets, oftentimes you think of, you know, fire and brimstone kinds of things. But their messages were very often ones that also include great comfort and, and really gospel kinds of things. And the minor prophets, those last 12 books of the Old Testament, say it with me, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Becca, Zephaniah, Hagar, Zechariah. Those guys are the minor prophets. And so we'll have a chance to hear from four of them during this month of February and hear how their words thousands of years ago still speak to us by the grace of God today. Later on today in the service, uh, we'll be receiving several new members, which means that after the service, there's going to be a potluck. And so towards the end of the service, you might see a few ladies kind of scurrying out to get things ready. That doesn't mean everybody can go. You have to wait. And so at the conclusion of the service, we'll have a few, a few moments just to take a kind of a group picture up here. If everybody else can sort of meander, wander over into the fellowship area, get ready, uh, maybe find a place. We'll have a prayer and then the meal. Okay, so let's go ahead and review our mission statement. We uh, do this each week to remind ourselves what it is we are really here for. So if you say it with me, grace exists to strengthen people in their relationship with Jesus Christ and to empower them to share Jesus with others. Let's sing our first song.
Sorry about that. How's that? So from Jonah chapter 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they asked him, What should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will be calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man, for you, Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We speak responsibly, Psalm 38. Answer me, O Lord, out of the goodness of your love. A mercy, turn to me. Save me, O God, for the water to my neck. I sink in the miry depths where there is no foothold. I am worn out calling for help. My throat is parched. Deliver me from those who hate me and from the deep waters. Do not let the flood waters engulf me or the depths swallow me or the pit close its mouth over me. Answer me, O Lord. A New Testament reading taken from the letter of 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Since you are eager for the gifts of the Spirit, try to excel in those that build up the church. For this reason, the one who speaks in a tongue should pray that they may interpret what they say. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. So what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will also pray with my understanding. I will sing with my spirit, but I will also sing with my understanding. Otherwise, when you are praising God in the Spirit, how can someone else who is now put in the position of an inquirer say amen to your thanksgiving, since they do not know what you are saying? You are giving thanks well enough, but no one else is edified. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you, but in the church, I would rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Brothers and sisters, stop thinking like children. In regard to evil, be infants, but in your thinking, be adults. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We stand to honor God's holy gospel. Gospel according to St. Luke, the fifth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. 
One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a great number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken, and so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We join our hearts and voices in confessing our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. Please be seated. Well, Miss April is going to come on up and we'll have the kids join her. How about right here in front?
May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord our God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, first of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Jonah. Jonah, son of Amittai, as it records in the Bible, and of all of the so-called minor prophets in Old Testament scriptures, I'm probably the most well-known, probably of all those minor prophets, once you hear the name Jonah, most people recognize that, which I find it just a little bit amusing that this should be the case, that I'm remembered really because of nothing more than an encounter with some oversized fish. And I really wish people would instead associate me less with a fish and more so really with God's limitless grace. It really comes down to that. Now, it's, it's my own fault, I suppose, because to be honest with you, I was not a very good prophet. It might surprise you to hear me say that, but I was not a very good prophet. I, I was not a really good example of of what a godly man should live like. I was not terribly loving. I was not very forgiving. I was, I was irritable. I had a quick temper. I had a lot of bad habits. And so my story is not one of honor or of heroic deeds. But really, my story is one of stubbornness, of meanness, but here's the thing. I want to be sure you understand that even though I was not a very good prophet in that sense, as far as being a man of God, I was a very effective preacher. And it was because I was such a great preacher that God selected me to do a very specific job, but a job that I hated. I hated more than anything else. The job he gave me was so repulsive that I couldn't even fathom doing it. See, like I said, I was not really loving in the first place. And then God asked me to do something what was beyond what I could stand, showing love to a people that I considered to be unlovable. You know what God told me to do, right? God told me to go preach his word in Nineveh. Nineveh, of all places to go, this would be the last place I wanted to go. Nineveh was the capital of our hated enemies, the Assyrians. It was the most wicked city that probably has ever existed. You have all heard of Sodom and Gomorrah, right? You know how God destroyed that city in one day, the fire and brimstone and so forth. Nineveh was worse, worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. And now God wanted me to go to this place in order to warn them. To warn them that if they didn't repent, the same thing that happened to Sodom and Gomorrah would surely happen to them. Well, no. <laughs> That's all I had to say to that. No, I wasn't going to do that. I did not want to get anywhere near those Ninevite people. God could have somebody else go, I suppose, but it wasn't going to be me. I mean, why would God want someone to go preach to a people like that. These people, they were wicked beyond description. Do you understand this? I mean, I, they were great warriors. We know that. I mean, the book of Genesis, just after the flood, there's a man, he's named there in Genesis as Nimrod, the father of all the great warriors, and, and it says that he founded the city of Nineveh. Great warriors, though, they all have one characteristic. They're mean, okay? The Ninevites were great warriors, not just because they had great military strategy, but because they were so mean, so brutal, so vicious. When the Assyrians would overrun a nation, for example, rather than just make the people of that nation their slaves, they did things like cut off the hands and the feet and, and, and even plucked out the eyes of the people that they captured. You see, it's, it, it was awful. You know, on, on one occasion, I mean, you'll hardly believe this is true, but I'm telling you it's true. On one occasion, the Assyrians overran a nation and the soldiers remembered that their king's birthday was coming up. 
And they thought of a great idea. They thought of a great gift, a present to provide for their king. And so on the morning of his birthday, they asked the king to go to the window and to look outside his window. And what he saw outside his window pleased the king of the Assyrians immensely because what his soldiers had done is they had piled up a huge mound of human heads. This is true. His warriors had done this as a, as a way of pleasing their king. It turns my stomach. But this is what these people were like. They were bloody. They were brutal beyond imagination. Another one of these minor prophets, the one named Nahum, Nahum, in his book, he gives this description. I'll share a little bit of Nahum. He calls Nineveh a city of blood, never without victims, many casualties, piles of dead bodies without number, people stumbling over corpses. So do you think I had any desire whatsoever to go and preach to those people? <laughs> no. Not, not me, not Jonah, son of Amittai. I mean, in, 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 so when God told me to go there, of course, I went straight down to the harbor, got in a boat, not going to Nineveh, but to Tarshish, the exact opposite direction. Tarshish, in case you don't know, that's western Spain, the edge of the world as we knew it at that point. And so I went, I thought, away from God. Foolish, right? Foolish to think that I could get away from God's presence. I mean, you can't go anywhere away from God's presence, can you? David, the psalmist, he writes about this in his Psalm 139. Where can I flee from God's spirit? If I go up to the skies, he is there. If I make my bed in the depths, he is there. If I rise in the wings of the dawn, or if I settle on the far side of the sea, even from there his hand will lead me. So absolutely, of course, I should have known better. Land, sea, sky, God's, God has presented all of them. You know, the prophet Isaiah, he's considered a major prophet. The prophet Isaiah, it, he, he writes there how God, God, he says, measures the seas in the hollow of his hand. Can you imagine that? Just cupping your hand for a bit of water. This is, this is what God's relationship to the sea is sort of like. And so there I was, having been tossed out of the boat, thinking I'm getting away from God, and now he's just has me in the cup of his hand like a bit of water. Of course, what happened was God sent a great storm on the sea. He was moving his hand, you see, so easy for him, but a great cataclysm for me. And, and there I was with those poor sailors getting tossed to and fro, and the, the sailors in the boat were all pagans, not to say they're atheists, they, they had spiritual ideas, but they certainly, they were misguided, let's say. Still, they sensed that something was wrong. They had never experienced a storm like this before, and they all prayed to their own gods to try to find some sort of relief from this, and of course, nothing happened, and so the, the captain of the boat found me, you know where the, the captain of the boat found me during all this? Asleep in the hold of the boat. And when he found me, he shook me to wake me up. And he said, what are you doing here sleeping when you ought to be praying to your God? It's ironic, isn't it? I mean, it's shameful that I, as a, as a prophet of the God Most High, had to be reminded to pray by a pagan. But you know, it occurs to me that unbelievers have to say that to us once in a while. They are working, struggling so hard in the world. They don't have any answers to the problems we face. Only we who worship the true God have the answers. That answer is found very often through our prayers in God. Who can do anything he wants? So, on board the boat, they cast lots, dice, to see whose fault all this storm was, who was the troublemaker, and naturally, of course, the, the lot fell to me. And with the storm raging around us, with panic creeping into the voices of these sailors, they looked at me and they said, Who are you? What have you done? Where are you from? And I told them, I'm a Hebrew, 
I'm a prophet. I'm fleeing from the presence of the Lord. And when they asked me then what they should do to satisfy God's anger, well, then they said, I told them, throw me overboard. Throw me into the sea. And when they did, it quieted down. See, I was not a coward, okay? I was not a coward. You may think that's why I didn't want to go to Nineveh, but I assure you I, was, I wasn't scared. These, these sailors, bless their hearts, they made one final attempt to, to row to shore, couldn't make it, and they threw me overboard, and down I went. Down I went into those stormy waters, and, and that's when God sent that great fish to swallow me. And I describe in my book, I describe there how I felt. What it was like going down into the bottom of the sea where the roots of the mountains are at and where, where the waters close over me, getting darker and darker and darker. And do you know what I was thinking as I was sinking down into the depths? I mean, you might be surprised to know that I was thinking of church. I was thinking of the temple in Jerusalem where God has promised to, 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 to be with us. I don't know, maybe you think it's strange that my thoughts at that point would be of the temple, of, of church. But let me tell you, my church, my church was everything to me because it was where I communed with God in person. And I just couldn't bear the thought of not seeing again. Maybe some of you feel that way about your church because you know this is where you have that special connection with God going on, especially when he feeds you his body and blood. My relationship, God, was the most precious thing in my life. And so from the belly of that fish, out of all the things going on, this is what was going through my head. And there in the sea, in the fish, I repented. I repented of my foolishness. And I think you know what happened then. After three days, the Lord had that fish regurgitate me on the shore, alive. It is so hard to explain what that's like. Being as good as dead, and then suddenly being alive again. Then, with hardly a chance to catch my breath, still covered with, you know, whale slime, the voice of God came to me again. Jonah, son of Amittai, go to Nineveh and preach the message that I give to you. This time I did. And I went to Nineveh. I still didn't want to go, you understand, but I, I could not not go after all the trouble God had gone through with this, right? And I'll never forget walking into that great city of Nineveh Incredible, right? Never seen anything like it. It went on and on for miles in every direction with five walls surrounding it, three canals bringing water into it, all built with a labor of conquered captives whose feet and hands they had not yet cut off. Limitless wealth everywhere. Spoils of war that they had gathered from all the places that they had conquered. And so I did as God commanded. And I walked through the streets of Nineveh, just me, with all those people, going back and forth, proclaiming on each of those streets the message of God, which really amounted to a very simple message. Forty days, I told them. Forty days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. Forty days. And then when I had done what God had called me to do, I went outside of the city, a little hill out there. I went up on the top of that hill when I... I sat down to wait, wait for those 40 days to elapse, waiting for what I was certain would be fire and brimstone coming down from heaven to destroy them. But instead, well, I was so angry at what happened next. I mean, I I told you, I told you I was a great preacher, right? That wasn't empty boasting. I was, I was not loving I was not forgiving, but I was a great preacher. And when I preached to those people in Nineveh, evil though they were, they knew they were hearing the word of God. And those Ninevites, they, they repented. They repented because I had preached the word of God to them. And news reached the king about what I had said. He called for a national period of repentance, of fasting, covering yourself with ashes, sitting in 
sackcloth, and he ordered the people of the entire city to do that. And this was amazing. This, this, this was wonderful, right? This was great. I should have been happy for them. I should have been grateful to see these people turn to God in repentance. But you know what? That's when I blew my stack. I mean, I told the Lord, I knew this would happen. <laughs> you see, this is why I tried to go the other direction. I knew this would happen. Lord, you know what a great preacher I am. You know what kind of, I know what kind of God you are. And I told you, Lord, I told you once they heard, they turned. I told you if they repented, you would forgive them. And it's, well, it's just wrong, God. It is, it's, it's just wrong. They don't deserve it. I would have been better off. I would have been better off. The whole world would have been better off if I would have drowned in the sea because then I wouldn't have got here and then you would have destroyed these people. You know what, Lord? I just wish I were dead. Have you ever had something happen to you that made you just so angry that you just, you just couldn't see straight? You just couldn't think straight, right? That's what was going on for me. I still couldn't believe it. And so for a while I sat there in that place just east of the city of Nineveh, out in the desert, in the scrub. I built a little shack for myself, kind of a really crude shelter, thinking that maybe, maybe God would come to his senses and destroy them anyway. And boy, wouldn't I love to see that. I wasn't going to miss that. But my goodness, it was hot. This is the desert, you understand. And this is the hot season. And, and almost fire and brimstone hot, really. And yet, for some reason, despite my lack of mercy, the Lord had mercy on me. You see, he had this great, this, this plant grow up right there next to me. A plant, all in one day, it grew and it spread its branches over me and gave me that little bit of shade. Just a little bit of shade, but it was so much more comfortable that way. And I, and I felt so much better because of it. I, I was happy to have that, that, that much mercy, to have that plant. But no sooner had my mood begun to improve than that very night God had this little worm bore into the base of that plant and the plant died. Then, as soon as it was daylight and the sun came out more brutal than ever. The south winds began to blow more hot than ever, and I was ready to faint. And I was so ticked off. And I let God know it. What is going on here, God? Why do you do this? All this trouble you go to, 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 for Nineveh? And then not destroying them, like they clearly deserve. And now, now this is the last straw. You take away my plant. Why don't you just let me die? And again, again, God said to me, Jonah, do you really have a right to be angry about your plant? And I said, yes, I'm angry enough to die. Aren't I entitled to it? After all, I've gone through, after everything I've been through, after everything you have put me through, don't I deserve just a little bit of shade that it offers? Now, but now you take away my plant. And then God said to me, God said, Jonah, think a minute. That was not your plant. That was my plant. You didn't make it grow. I made it grow. You didn't have it die. I had it die. It's my plant to do with as I please. You see, that's the way it is for Nineveh, Jonah. Don't you see? Those are my people. Jonah, you didn't create them. I created them. You didn't labor over them and cry over them. I have. And even if they were just cattle, even if they were just dumb beasts, don't I have a right to be merciful to them if I want to? And in fact, God still, God still demonstrates his mercy to you very much as he did to me by drowning and yet not drowning. It's called baptism. In baptism, God's children are plunged into the waters. 
And there in that little font, kind of like the hollow of God's hand, by the power of God, your sins are drowned. They're done to death. But then, see there's a double image here, because then there's an image not just of death and drowning, but of resuscitation and of living. In those baptismal waters, you meet your maker, just as I did when I was down in the depths of the sea. Then, then from out of the waters, we rise, forgiven, with a new lease on life, eternal life. Any one of us, any one of us, if left to ourselves, will head away from God, just like I headed to Tarshish. It is after being plunged into the drowning waters and then revived by our saving God that his grace becomes the most real to us. In the New Testament book of Romans, it says that in the drowning and rising of baptism, you are connected to Jesus' own death and resurrection. How amazing is that? Despite the fact that I was so self-centered, that I was so immature, I'm the only prophet of the Old Testament that Jesus ever compared himself to. Not that Jesus was self-centered or immature, but like me, he went through judgment, condemnation, and death before then experiencing rising to life. So my story, you understand now? My story is not simply the story of being swallowed by a fish. And in fact, my story isn't even about me. I almost wish you didn't call it the book of Jonah. Maybe, maybe call it the book of God's mercy, the book of God's compassion. It's how God comes to deal with every one of us. And I'll bet you know someone too. Maybe you know a person or maybe you know a group of people who you feel don't deserve God's mercy just like I didn't think the Ninevites did. And maybe God wants to change your mind about that. Day by day, we make all kinds of decisions that affect our future, but believe me, you cannot outplan God. And there's no limit as to how far he will go to use you to accomplish his purposes. Turn to him in prayer. Come to him in repentance. Pursue his will. Seek out his grace. And one more thing, please, if God ever tells you to go to Nineveh, just go. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to stand as we do turn to God in sincere confession. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness before God, tainted by our own sin and corrupted by the evil of the world. Yet together as his people, we take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Jesus and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we confess that we have sinned against you and against each other in thought, word, and deed by our failure to do good as well as by the wrong we have done. We have sinned and cannot free ourselves. Show us your mercy, O Lord, and forgive us for the sake of Jesus Christ, whose obedient life and life-giving death has redeemed us. Restore us by your Spirit, that we may live holy and righteous lives, worthy of those who wear your name by a baptism. Amen. Although we are unworthy, God is completely worthy. Although we might run away from him like Jonah did, God breaks into our lives with words of peace. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. You see, Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for you. 
and for his sake forgives you all your sins. Therefore, as a called and ordained servant of Jesus Christ and by his authority, I tell you that your sins are all forgiven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let's sing. Please be seated as we now worship the Lord with our offerings. When the offering plates come forward, please don't stand yet at that time. Uh, once the offering plates have come forward, we'll be inviting our new members who are joining today to step forward. I'll indicate that. Uh, and then uh, we'll have the uh, follow-up verse to sing after that. If I could have our newly joining members, please come forward at this time, and you'll take a place just somewhere in front of me here, along the uh, uh, front of the kneeler. Just spread yourselves out along here precisely and evenly, or close, anyway. Take some space down that way, that'd be great. So we have 12 and a half. <laughs> <laughs> when do you do again? Uh, three. In three weeks? Are you excited? All right. Very good. Dear friends of Christ, our Lord Jesus has said to his apostles, whoever confesses me before man, I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. And so at this time, I invite you to lift up your hearts to the God of all grace and to pr prayer for, joyfully give your answers to what I now ask you in the name of the Lord. Do you this day, in the presence of God and of this congregation, acknowledge the gifts that God has given you in your baptism? Then answer, yes, I do. Yes, I do. Do you renounce the devil and all his works and all his ways? Then answer, yes, I renounce them. Yes, I renounce them. Do you believe in God, the Father Almighty, in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, and in the Holy Spirit? Then answer, Yes, I do believe. Yes, I do believe. Do you hold all the prophetic and apostolic scriptures to be the inspired word of God and the doctrine of the evangelical Lutheran church drawn from that word of God to be faithful and true? Then answer, I do. I do. 
Do you intend to hear the word of God and receive the Lord's Supper faithfully? Then answer, I do, by the grace of God. Do you intend to live according to the word of God and in faith, word, and actions to remain true to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, even to death? Then answer, I will by the grace of God. And now, do you desire to become a member of this congregation, Grace Lutheran Church? Then answer, I do. I do. Will you support the work that our gracious Lord has given to this congregation with your prayers and the gifts that God has given to you, then answer, I will, with the help of God. I will, with the help of God. Then, upon this, your confession of faith, I as the pastor here, and on behalf of the entire congregation, welcome you as members of Grace Lutheran Church, joined by the Holy Spirit into one body in Christ, to receive with us all the blessings that our Lord has given to his church, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Before you go, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for your great goodness in bringing these, your sons and daughters, to the knowledge of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and enabling both with the heart to believe and with the mouth to confess his saving name. Grant that by the work of your Holy Spirit, they would continue steadfast in the one true faith as Together, we await the day when all who have fought the good fight of faith shall receive the crown of righteousness through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Go back to your seats in peace in the name of the Lord. As they're going back to their seats, the congregation is invited to stand as we sing the final verse of the song. are you, O Lord our God, for you made all things for your glory and still preserve them. When we abandoned you to pursue our own glory, we brought death and destruction upon ourselves. Yet you did not abandon us to our chosen fate. You intervened with hope through the prophets and, and the promise of redemption through, our own, through your own Son. He was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and accomplished salvation for us by his suffering, death, and resurrection. Assembled in his name, we eagerly desire the gift of himself in this bread and wine, as his word promises. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. And then in the same way also after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do, as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
As usual, we'll do the communing by having you ushered forward on the center aisle, returning by the side aisles. Uh, if need be, you can request whether uh, gluten-free host or low-alcohol wine while you're kneeling here. Also, if you come up only to receive a blessing, that's certainly acceptable. Please do so. Also, indicate that by having your hands being folded across your shoulders while you're kneeling if you're just receiving the blessing. The meal is ready.
Now as we once more prepare to go to God's throne of grace in prayer, some special requests to share with you. Uh, peace for the family of Carolyn Wallace, longtime member who passed away last week. I think her funeral was yesterday, is that right, up in Durant? Uh, Jack and Kim uh, hospitalized right now for respiratory illness and for COVID. For the uh, Beach, is it Beach or Besh? Besh family? Uh, the brother had open heart surgery last week. Also for our, the homeless, especially during the times of inclement weather that they have shelter and warmth. And a prayer request for Ernest Ram. That's, uh, uh, is that Nancy, your dad? Who had foot surgery, or having foot surgery on Wednesday. Let's stand to pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, your mercy and grace are beyond all telling. And yet, so often, the mercy and grace we show to one another can be so sorely lacking. We're grateful to receive it from you, but sometimes less willing to share it with others. Lord, break into our hearts, into our souls, into our lives, that we reflect you more and more every day, that people can see the, G the cross of Jesus in us and through us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we give you thanks for all the blessings of life, for seeing us safely through these treacherous days of weather. We also give you thanks on behalf of those we know who have special reasons as they celebrate milestones in life this very week for the baptismal birthday of Mackenzie Hunter, the birthdays of Isaiah Bray and Richard Ott, Elaine Botka, Ken Franz, the wedding anniversary of Pastor David and Elvira Reese. Lord, for these and for all of us, show us how best to thank you as we not only give you words of praise, but also live out that thanks in how we uh, relate to each other. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we also come to you for those who are in special need at this time, physical needs and, and otherwise. We pray for the family of Carolyn Wallace, for Jack, for Kim, for the Besh family, for Ernest, for those who are homeless and, and in need. Pray for Robin as she continues her transition from the facility she has been at to her home. Lord, for these and so many others, we give them into your hands, asking that you do what you know is best, that you receive the glory and honor. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And finally, Lord, we pray for ourselves, for your church everywhere around the world, but especially here at Grace Lutheran. Continue to keep us on the path you would have us go as we continue through the pastoral call process. May all of it be according to your will and glorifying to your name. And now, Lord, everything else that is on our hearts and minds we bring it to you by praying together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.
Please be seated. So uh, in just a moment, we'll be dismissed from here. I will not be going to the back to greet you, although I know some of you will probably have to leave, but hopefully most, if not all of you, can stick around for uh, the, uh, the potluck. Um, but uh, when that dismissal time comes, rather than going back there, I'm going to wait up here for our new members to come up. We want to have a kind of a group picture with you. The rest of you all can sort of head in that direction. Uh, by the way, for members, if you have your name tags with you, I invite you to put those on, especially today, for the sake of our new members, so they can kind of look at you and take a peek at your name tag, know who you're at. So we're going to get out to all of that in just a moment, but first of all, I have one or two announcements, I think, right? So let me grab you a blue microphone. Okay, I'm going to actually let them announce it since it's for them. So bear with them. They're a little nervous, okay? <laughs> okay. Um, we are still selling subs, so if you need, if you need to order any more, we have them. Yeah. So Super Bowl is next Sunday. So, yeah. Go Dallas. <laughs> <laughs> so we need your forms now. Um, we're also here to invite you to Valentine's dinner, um, of course, on February the 14th. Um, everyone is welcome to come. There will be child care available, and if you have any questions, please contact the church office. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so just a few little minor details they missed. So Subway Form Super Bowl is next Sunday, so we need our forms and money in by Wednesday at the latest so we can make sure that we have time to go get everything, to have that prepped. Everything will be ready to go and out here for you to pick up by your name after worship on Sunday. So right after church, you can grab your sandwiches and go enjoy the football game. Um, also, Valentine's dinner is on the 14th. We'll have it all set up. It'll be nice. You can get dressed up, have a little date night. We'll have a little bit of music, so you can even dance a little bit if you like. Um, <laughs> if you plan on coming, if you could just either give me a shout or call the church office and just let us know how many so we can make sure we got enough food for you. Okay, Glenn, were you getting ready? Yes, I'd like to uh, let you remind you to check your mailboxes. Your contributions are in there. If you hadn't already picked them up, you know, and we wait another week or two, but like I said, we'll have to send them out um, to your address or whatever. So if you would, go ahead and stop by there. You might have something else in there. You don't know. <laughs> and Glenn, I take it we're still waiting, seeing for the district to get back with us, right? We're yes, still we in hold and hold on that. We, so nothing. we haven't heard anything yet. We have an elder meeting this Saturday, and we may have the information by then. Okay, thanks. All right, anything else to announce? Yeah, Ken? <laughs> and what's the place called again? Cooley Bay, Bay Winery in Van Elstein. All right, on Friday the 11th, your birthday. Good, a birthday present to us. Anything else to announce? If, uh, again, if the new members could come on up here, get a picture, the rest of you can migrate that way, uh, wait for us to get in there, we'll have a little meal prayer, and then we'll dig in. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Mm -hmm.